Hey, welcome to Armchair Preacher. We'd open up your Bibles to Revelation 21, verse 15. Planning to cover verses 15 through 23 today. I've called this the details of New Jerusalem. We've already seen some of the details. Last time we saw the 12 gates in verse 12. We talked about those were there for the Gentiles. Know which gate to enter into. Then you've got the wall with the 12 foundations with the names of the 12 apostles in verse 14. And that's for the Jews. Uh, now we're going to get a little more detail of the city. Starting in verse 15. What we'll do, we'll read verses 15 through 23, and then we'll come back and look at look at what it all says. Uh, Revelation 21, 15. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, an hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall <coughs> of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Uh, so that pretty much finishes your description of the city, New Jerusalem. Uh, so now we'll go back here. Uh, verse 15 it says, he that talked with me. Uh, that's a reference going back to... Um, uh, where is it? Anyway, it's an angel. <laughs> I can't see where the reference is, but basically it's a... Is that verse 3? Well, verse 3 is the great voice out of heaven. Um... Oh, verse 9, here, chapter 21, verse 9. There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials. So, um, so he that talked with me is an angel. Um, that's important when we get down to verse 17. Uh, so, verse 15, you just note that uh, he's an angel. He has a golden reed to measure the city. And that's pretty much what he's going to do, measure the city, the gates, and the wall. So you can see what it's all about. Verse 16, your first fill in the blank is that New Jerusalem is four square. It says, and the city lieth four square. And I wrote down there, which means it is not a triangle. Uh, four square is just, you know, and the reason I say that is because uh, it's been said that the third heaven is a triangle. And, and that's why maybe the Egyptians made pyramids, sort of copying what God did. And, yeah, that may be true as far as the third heaven. Uh, maybe that is a triangle. Uh, I don't know. But, but we know from this scripture here that New Jerusalem is not a pyramid or it's not a triangle. It's, uh, four, it's four square. So it's going to be a square with four equal sides to it instead of a triangle, which is something with three sides. Uh, so since it lies four square, I just made the note it's not a triangle. Um, the next thing I wanted to note is there in verse 16, it says, The city lieth four square. The length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. 12,000 furlongs. There are eight furlongs to a mile. So that tells you that this city is 1,500 miles. A lot of times we think of a city, you think of a big city like New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, those are nothing compared to this. 1,500 miles, to give you an idea, 1,500 miles wide 
is about the width from Washington down to California. Um, pretty much the, if you look at the United States on a map, north to south is, I think it's like 1,700 miles. So it's almost the complete width of the continental United States. And then if you look at the length of the United States from east coast to west coast is maybe about 2,300 miles if you just went straight, maybe 2,500 at the most. Uh, so what you've got here is a city that's as high as going up to top of Washington, down to the bottom of California, and then across to maybe where the, the Midwest is, you know, Kansas, um, Missouri, somewhere in that area. Um, that's the city. So it's huge. It's not like LA is a big city, but it's only you know a few miles. I don't know, even maybe even 25, 30 miles. I don't know. Uh, this is 1,500 miles. So it's bigger than any city we've ever seen on Earth. But in addition to that, and this is your next fill in the blank, is that um, well, well, no, it's not. Um, uh, the city, their next fill in the blank is the city is massive because God's government will increase forever. Isaiah 9. So the reason, if you go to Isaiah 9, the reason the city is so big, you think of a big city like L.A., 25, 30 miles, you compare it to this, this is nothing, it's 1,500 miles wide and long. It's like two-thirds of the U.S., so it's, it's huge. The reason is because what we see in Isaiah 7, Talking about God's kingdom, Isaiah 9, I'm sorry, Isaiah 9, um, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. So in the kingdom, on the, on the earth, his second coming, that's when he is controlling the government. It's God's government on earth. And it says, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon His kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So it's an everlasting kingdom. There in verse 7 it says, even forever. So it lasts forever. But verse 7 also says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. So the, the government continues to, so it lasts forever, lasts for all eternity. It's going to, the kingdom, uh, the, and it will continue to increase forever. Um, so it just keeps going out farther and farther and farther and farther. That's why the city is so big. So you think of a city... Uh, when we looked at the Great White Throne Judgment a few lessons ago, I noted that of approximately 100 billion people who have ever lived, probably less than a billion are, um, uh, you know, less than a billion are actually going to be in this kingdom. Well, then it's going to keep growing. They're going to live forever, so they're going to be there. They're not going to die off. Uh, there are going to be new people going to be born, and so there's going to be more and more people in here. So you've got to have a big city to house that uh, and that's just the city that's just really governmental headquarters it's sort of like you think of the US Washington DC that's where our federal government is located that's where all the governmental offices are for federal government well that's just a small part of the United States it doesn't take up the entire United States so this city 1500 miles that's just the government seat like Washington DC then you've got the rest of the whole world, and that's, you know, that's going to take up where all these other people are going to be. Um, so it's not that the billion people are just in that city. It's just the headquarters for that billion people is going to be in that city. And then the rest of the world, the people are going to be spread out. But then the government, it just continues to grow more and more people. Um, so, and that's why it, it's funny because scientists will say that the universe is continuing to expand and that's their theory as far as the Big Bang Theory. They'll say, you know, well, the Big Bang happened, and then it all spread out, and that's how we got the Earth and all these things created. And they, their proof of this is because the, the 
universe keeps expanding. So they say, oh, the Big Bang, it keeps going on. That doesn't have nothing to do with the Big Bang. It's intelligent design by God as the Creator. And the reason it keeps expanding is that He's going to be here forever. And people aren't going to die. So there's going to be more and more people. You got more and more people, you need more and more room. So it expands. Um, you know, if you just believe your Bible, it all makes perfect sense. Um, but, so, the reason, and you're filling the blank, the city is massive because government, God's government will increase forever. So we need more room. Another thing to think about also is, and this is your next fill in the blank, is that God will also build the city upward. He will also build the city upward. Because if we think of, say, Washington, D.C., government seat, we're going to have that, but it's going to be covering two-thirds of the U.S. See, that's a massive city. Well, compounded by that is, you know, today we think of that, you think, okay, you walk on the earth, you drive a car, you do all this. Well, in the kingdom, you've got all of this air. Because it said there in Revelation 21.16, that it's 15, the city is 1,500 miles, but it says the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. For us, when we're living on earth today with gravity and everything, it doesn't matter. We don't know how high it goes up, how high the sky is, you know, where's the top, I don't know how high it is, and it doesn't really matter. You can't really go that high. Uh, Mount Everest is 30,000 feet. If you if you got out on Mount Everest today from sea level and went there, you'd die because of the lack of oxygen. You couldn't survive. Even if you acclimated yourself, you, it, you know, it takes a while. Planes can go a little higher than that. Um, but really, how far high, how up far can you go? Um, 100,000 feet is not even 20 miles. We can't even go up 20 miles into the air. Well, rockets, they go up to the moon, but we're talking 1,500 miles, and it's all inhabitable, just like 1,500 miles on Earth, just like we can inhabit the land from California over to Kansas, or from Washington to California, we can do that 1,500 miles on the land. That's God's city, but it also goes up that height, too. We don't think about that because we can't do that, but it'll be possible in God's kingdom. We're going to look at Amos 9 and also Luke 24. So Amos 9 is where we get the idea that God is also going to build the city upward. Amos 9. Verse 5. Amos 9, 5. And the Lord God of hosts is he that toucheth the land, and it shall melt, and all that dwell therein shall mourn. And it shall rise up wholly like a flood, and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. So that's reference to second coming, uh, destruction there. Then later on you got the new heaven and the new earth. We're going over that in Revelation. Now we're going to see in verse 6 that the new heaven and the new earth, that new earth, the new Jerusalem. He builds it upward. Amos 9, 6. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven, and hath founded his troop in the earth. He that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. So there we're told that in that uh, governmental structure on earth, he is building his stories in the heaven. He goes up. Revelation 21 says the city is 1,500 miles high, just like it is wide and the length. Uh, you know, on earth as it is with gravity, we don't need to know how high it goes because we can't really go. They build high rises, but you got the Empire State Building. I think there are some other buildings that maybe go up 200 stories. I don't know how many, even if that's a mile, I don't even know. It probably is. Um, maybe they can build a, a skyscraper, they call it, that goes up one mile. Well, God's going to build it up 1,500 miles. I mean, a lot higher. And you know, to get to that Empire State Building, to get to the top floor, you got to get on an elevator and go up like that. You don't have the problem of gravity in the New Jerusalem. You've got new bodies. And look over at Luke 24. I wrote on your outline that God will also build the city upward since glorified man can disappear and reappear. In other words, today, if we built a, 
if we built a city and the entire thing goes up 1,500 miles, no one could get to the top. You couldn't even get up a, a mile unless maybe an elevator could take you up that high. Uh, any higher, you'd die from lack of oxygen. Um, well, any higher than two or three miles, you'd die from lack of oxygen uh, instantly. But, uh, but if you've got a new body and you don't have gravity to hold you down, and you don't have to abide by the rules of the earth that we have now, uh, then it doesn't matter. It can go up that high. Just like we can travel from a car in a car from California to Kansas on the land, you could, you could just be in California one day on the ground and the next second up here in an area of Kansas 1,500 miles up. You could just disappear and reappear. Uh, so gravity and travel and all that, not a problem in New Jerusalem. And to give you an example, Luke 24, Jesus Christ, when he rose from the dead, he had his glorified body. And you can see um, when he's on the road to Emmaus, he's talking to a couple of people here. Um, look in verse 13, Luke 24, 13. Behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs, 60 furlongs. Remember, eight furlongs to a mile. So that's, what, seven and a half miles. So here he has seven and a half miles. Jesus, um, uh, you look verse 14, they talked together of all these things which had happened and came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So you're seven and a half miles from Jerusalem, Jesus is, um, they're talking about scripture and things. Now look in verse 31. It says, And their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. I mean, this wasn't a magic trick. He's literally, he's in Emmaus with these people, with these two men, and he literally, he just vanishes in the thin air. No, no magic trick. He dematerialized. He's just gone. And then, um, you go down to, and then it says that, uh, well, in verse uh, 33, it says, They rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them. So, you know, you're seven and a half miles away. Uh, back then, people were in good shape. They walked everywhere. Uh, this was a big thing. You know, they just found Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, had appeared to them, and he just disappeared and uh, in, the, in their sight. So... The uh, first thing they do is they, they run. Basically, they run to Jerusalem. Seven and a half miles, they make it in an hour, probably. It says they at least rose up the same hour. And the eleven gathered there. Uh, verse 34, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in breaking bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Notice verse it doesn't say anything about Jesus, um, you know, packing his bag, running over to Jerusalem, um, getting there. What we see about Jesus, that these people had to do it. They've got bodies just like us. They had to rise up, run over there. They start to say what happened. But what we see about Jesus is that, verse 31, he vanished out of their sight. Verse 36, he just stands in the midst of them. And you could see that this is, again, they, they, he didn't just come in normally because verse 37 says, they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. I mean, if you're just in a, a room and all of a sudden Jesus appears and there's somebody appears in the middle and you're thinking it's a ghost, it's something going on. Uh, same thing happened in the book of John. They were The twelve were gathered behind a locked door. Uh, I'm sorry, the eleven gathered, Judas Iscariot uh, hung himself. The eleven are gathered behind a locked door. Um, Jesus just appears in the midst of them. Uh, so the point is that when Jesus got his new body, he was no longer subject to the laws of the earth like we have to. He didn't have to rise up, pack his bag, run, or you know, walk to a certain spot. He just vanished out of sight, and he reappeared seven and a half miles down the road uh, in the middle of this room. So the laws that we're subject to in our old bodies, we don't have in the new bodies. So since we don't have those laws in the new bodies, if you can just disappear here, 
in one place and reappear someone, somewhere else. If God has this city that's 1,500 miles long and wide and high, you're in the bottom corner of it, let's say, and you get a call, God says, you know, Jesus says, well, we, I need you up here on uh, mile 1,498 in the top in this other corner. And you just disappear where you are reappear up there. Whereas if you're, if today, you know, traveling 1,500 miles, even in a plane, and going up as well as going across, take a lot longer. Uh, since we're not subject to those laws that we have today, and you can just disappear and reappear, then there's no problem, in other words, for the city to be not only 1,500 miles wide and long, but also high. And you can put a lot of people in that big of a space, two-thirds of the United States, and you've got all these stories going up for 1,500 miles. Billions and billions of people can go into there. Uh, so space is not going to be a problem when you consider the height element, too. Building and upward. Okay, so back to Revelation 21. Uh, so verse 16, we see that city, line 4 square. Uh, we see the length and the breadth and the height equal, 1,500 miles each way. Now verse 17, he's going to measure the wall. It says, he measured the wall thereof, 140 and 4 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. I wrote in your outline that angels look like men. They do not have wings. And it says there, because it says, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. We saw in verse 15, the one who had the golden reed was an angel, according to verse 9. Um, it's not that they're men. Hebrews 2 Psalm 8 says that God made man a little lower than the angels. And men are not able to, at least now, right now, without the glorified bodies, they're not able to fly and go around like angels. They are also, um, they have bodies, soul, and spirit. Um, angels are spirits, ministering spirits. They may take a body in order to, you know, get around on the earth. But um, the point of this, though, is that the fact that it says the measure of a man that is of the angel uh, shows that God is equating angels to men as far as their appearance is concerned, which means they're not these women with the real long flowing hair and the wings that people ordinarily attribute angels to. Uh, it's interesting that people think of that because um, that's... The, the appearance of, of what people think an angel is is not unlike what Satan looks like. Satan is a cherub and cherubs have wings. Uh, so the, the picture of what people think angels look like are what um, Satan looks like. And it's no, no coincidence that 1 Corinthians 11, actually I think it may be 2 Corinthians 11, God says that Satan has transformed himself into an angel of light. So he's taken his status as a cherub, a fallen cherub, and he's made himself out to be an angel uh, by taking the, the form of an angel and making it look like what he looks like. And that's why people think of that. Um, that's a side note to what we're studying. Uh, if we go back to um, verse 17 now, Revelation 21, so he measured the wall, verse 18 says, And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto glass. Um, if you go back to verse 14, it talks about the foundations. I want to talk about this a little bit. It says, The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the lambs, uh, of the Lamb. Um, I wrote on your outline, the saved Israel is likened unto God's jewels. You see the foundations of the wall there, and then down in verse 19, it says the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. And it gives a listing of 12 stones. Um, just like the city, the glory of God that we saw in verse 11 has to do with saved Israel. The reason that New Jerusalem has the glory of God is really the faithful there, the believers in Israel, they reflect the glory of God. It's the same type of thing with the jewels. 
the reason you've got these precious jewels is that's really saved Israel. They, uh, if you go over to Malachi chapter 3, we're going to look at a few scriptures. Uh, Malachi chapter 3, it's just before the book of Matthew. Uh, when we see the tribulation period, uh, they're likened unto, Israel is likened unto uh, jewels that go through a refiner's fire, the tribulation period. Verse 2, Malachi 3, verse 2. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as, as, as in the days of old, and as in former years. So you can see the idea, just like a jewel is, a, is part of a rock, and to get the impurities out of that rock, you have to take it through the fire, burn off the impurities. On the other side comes the pure jewel. That's what God does with the tribulation period with the nation of Israel. They've got sin, they're laden down with that unbelief, and the trial, fiery trials of the tribulation takes off the impurities of unbelief so that they come forth at the other end as a precious jewel. Look over in Job 23. You can see a similar type thing. The book of Job, while the events in the book of Job actually did happen to a man named Job and his friends there, it's given in the scripture as a type of what Israel will go through in the tribulation period. Just like Job is a righteous man, but yet he goes, everything's taken away from him. He has nothing. Uh, at the end, he is restored and brought in and has more than uh, what he had at the first. Same thing with Israel. Saved Israel with their faith in God. Everything's taken away from them under the Antichrist. But at the end, they're restored and they get more in God's kingdom. And Job 23 Talking about this trying period that Israel have to go through, verse 10, Job 23, 10, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So again, saved Israel likened unto some precious jewels here. Silver and gold in Malachi 3, they're called gold here in Job 23. And then um, we notice that the when it talked about there in Revelation 21, the foundations of the wall were garnished with all manner of precious stones. Uh, the foundations had the names of the twelve apostles. Uh, another thing to note is that this building here, the temple and New Jerusalem, is not, although it's physically there, uh, spiritually speaking, God's temple is built with saved people. Uh, it's Certainly it is a physical building, but it's really, um, you know, it's, it's really a people. In fact, verse 23 in Revelation 21 says, I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So there it tells you the Lamb is the temple. Well, we are the church, the body of Christ. So we're part of Christ. Uh, so if the Lamb is a temple, then we would be part of the temple. Israel, saved Israel, is the bride of Christ. When a bride and her husband get married, the two become one flesh. So she, as the Lamb's wife, is a part of the Lamb. And if the Lamb is the temple, then the Lamb's wife is the temple as well. And we're going to look at a couple of verses. We're going to see it in Israel's program, and we're going to see it in our program program today, the body of Christ. So let's look in Ephesians 2 and also 1 Peter 2. Ephesians 2, of course, verse 8 and 9, By grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we are, as part of the body of Christ, we are created in Christ Jesus. We are God's workmanship. And then if you go down to verse 
20, it says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 